Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining the Native Alternatives to Common Invasive Garden Plants webinar. I'm Megan Pistoli Shaw, the Education and Outreach Coordinator with Slila Prism. How are you doing? And I'm Cecilia Persian. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with the Western New York Prism. Hello. Here is a quick snapshot of what we will discuss today. I'd like to note that there will be a follow-up email sent to those who registered that will have a link to this recording along with the resources that we shared today. This webinar is one of many events occurring in observance of New York's Invasive Species Awareness Week, or NISA, held annually from June 6th through the 12th. NISA is a statewide education outreach campaign aimed to raise awareness of invasive species and to encourage the public to take action to prevent the spread of invasives. Learn of events happening throughout the state at nyis.info slash nyisa, and be sure to tune in to special NYSAL webinars to be held at 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern, now until Friday. And at the end of this presentation, we will share a link to an online survey that helps to gauge the effectiveness of NYSA and if you complete the survey, you will be entered into a drawing to win prizes. NYSA is supported by Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management or PRISMS in collaboration with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, also known as the DEC, and many partner organizations and volunteers. The PRISM Network is an integrated approach to invasive species management and it spans the entire state of New York. The network is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund in coordination with the DEC and various host organizations. Before we dig too deep, let's start with the basics and consider what invasive species are. So an invasive species can be a plant, an animal, or even a microorganism that is not native to the ecosystem they've become established in and whose introduction causes harm to the economy, the environment, or to human health. The term invasive species can easily be confused as there are many non-native species that are not considered to be invasive. For example, apples and many other agricultural plants are non-native species that are considered beneficial to our culture rather than harmful. There are also species that are considered to be a nuisance but are not invasive, like dandelions, for example. And you may wonder why some non-natives are so invasive to begin with. Well, this is because when a species is introduced to a new environment, they enter that new area free from environmental factors that keep their populations in balance, like natural predators or parasites. In addition, invasives also often produce many offspring or seeds. For example, one adult purple loosestrife plant can produce millions of seeds annually. Because of these characteristics, invasive populations often become very widespread which you can see in the bottom picture that shows invasive common reed or phragmites filling an entire field with just a single shrub existing in the mass. In addition to lacking natural predators, invasive species also have attributes that allow them to thrive in environments that other species may not do so well in, such as poor soil conditions. Pictured in the top right shows invasive Japanese knotweed growing right out of a hole in concrete. So if invasives are so bad for the environment, then why are they even here to begin with? Well, there are many different ways that invasives can be introduced into a new area, but a major introduction pathway is through global trade. Invasives from around the world hitchhike in ballast water and in cargo crates and often go undetected until they have spread far distances in their new homes. And many plants that are now considered to be invasive were once considered desired ornamentals that were often intentionally planted by people in gardens, yards, and in landscapes. Uh, for example, Japanese and bush honeysuckles are invasive plants that were often planted by gardeners to beautify their lawns or by highway designers to control erosion or stabilize banks. However, over time, non-native species can misbehave and escape our gardens and invade our natural areas where they can outcompete native and desirable plant species and can impact entire ecosystems. 
However, you can play a vital role in preventing the introduction and spread of invasive plants by simply choosing to grow native plants in your gardens or your yards. Choosing native plants not only reduces the spread of invasive plants, but it also supports native wildlife. This is because native plants have co-evolved with native wildlife and insects. There are many specialized relationships that exist between plants, birds, and pollinators. For example, native birds like the chickadee rely on caterpillars to rear their young and native plants support caterpillars. Monarch butterflies, they need native milkweed to complete their life cycle. Without milkweed, monarch larvae will die. An invasive plant called swallowwort are closely related to native milkweed and monarchs can get confused and lay their eggs on the invasive swallowwort, which is toxic to the monarch caterpillars. So by choosing to grow native plants in your garden, you are supporting birds, pollinators, and other wildlife. Plus, native plants support important pollinators like bees and other insects, which we all rely on for a majority of our crops. Here are a few quick tips to consider for using native plants to support pollinators. First, diversify. Use at least 15 different flowering species. Plant diversity equals wildlife diversity and it strengthens the resiliency of your garden against pests and pathogens. Successional blooming. Grow plants that bloom in the spring, in the summer, and into the fall, so there's food available throughout the growing season, and planting like species in groups reduces the amount of work that the pollinators do, or need to do to get to the good stuff. Also, avoid hybrid species as they often have exaggerated plant parts, that hinder the ability of pollinators to utilize the plant. Now Cecilia is going to lead our discussion by sharing some examples of common invasive garden plants and their native alternatives. Thanks, Megan. Yes, I'm gonna give you remote control if I can find you. There you go. Awesome, thank you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some common invasive species that you might notice uh, you have in your garden, um, whether they were there when you bought your house or whether you planted them without realizing they were invasive. Um, the first thing is identifying them. And then the next would be to pick out um, some native alternatives that would be great in place of the invasives that are there. So let's start with bush honeysuckle. Um, oh, I skipped right to the native alternative, sorry. There we go, there we go, bush honeysuckles. Um, so uh, these are deciduous uh, shrubs that can grow to be about 15 feet tall. Um, there are native honeysuckles in our region um, and a really easy way to tell them apart is to cut off a branch and look for the hollow hole in the cross section. Um, invasive honeysuckles are the ones that have the hole. This plant has small pink or white flowers, um, and later in the season, it forms red berries. The thing about these berries are that birds can eat the fruit, but it is a much uh, lower quality nutrition than native berries. Um, so when you think of birds eating fast food every day instead of eating a delicious home-cooked meal. Um, the, leaves, the shrubs also leaf out early in the spring and can shade out native plants from growing underneath. Um, and then also they're very hard to manage. If you trim it back, sometimes multiple branches will try and go back in its place. They're not low maintenance. So some great native alternatives for uh, bush honeysuckle would be serviceberry and American elderberry. And you can see both of these shrubs um, have white flowers and then they also give way to dark berries in the um, fall. So um, aesthetically, they're very similar to honeysuckles, but their berries are much more nutritious for native wildlife. And they do have that beautiful um, floral, if that's what you're looking for in your garden. Our next species is butterfly bush. And these plants are eye-catching and hardy and seemingly helpful to butterflies and other pollinators. They're called butterfly bushes, of course, but they are invasive. Um, although butterflies are attracted to their long pinnacles of bright flowers, 
This plant supports pollinators at only one stage in their life cycle. It provides copious nectar, but butterflies also need to have host plants on which to lay eggs and on which their caterpillars feed. And as far as we know, there's no native caterpillars that will fly, well, that will eat butterfly bush leaves. So um, they only support them in the feeding phase. Um, and also these shrubs can easily escape cultivation and invade natural areas, uh, crowding out native plants. So if you're looking for those long purple flowers, I might suggest Summer Sweet or Blazing Star or Giant Hyssop. They have very, very similar shaped flowers and they are native and will provide, um, provide benefits for the pollinators throughout more than one phase in their life cycle. Multiflora rose is another deciduous shrub um, that we find. Um, and so this plant has thorns and clusters of white flowers as opposed to native roses, which only have one flower at the end of each stem. Um, it forms red berries later into the season, as you can see in the lower picture, the berries are starting to form. Multiflora rose produces thick brambles, which will ex exclude native vegetation. And it's also the host of the rose rosette disease, which affects all roses, and it can transfer the disease from this invasive plant to your native roses in your garden. Um, this plant is extremely prolific, which means it pronounced, pr produces large amounts of seeds, um, which are dispersed by birds, and the seeds can remain viable in the soil for up to 20 years. So even if you feel like you've removed all of these plants, um, they could pop up again over time. Some great native alternatives. Let me see. Is my speaker working better now? Um, I'm going to just keep going and hopefully the sound uh, will have evened itself out. Um, so the nine bark, button bush, and spice bush are all great native alternatives. Um, the nine bark and the button bush have a similar shaped uh, or similar colored flowers as the multiflora leaves multi-flora roses, and the spice bush gives you like that great color um, for the fall. Okay, thanks, Megan. Just having some trouble going through these. Okay. Um, Japanese barberry um, is another um, invasive shrub. It just has thorns. It doesn't get as tall as some of the other shrubs that I've been talking about, but it can get very like wide and bushy. Um, it's commonly used in landscaping. You might see these in commercial parks or outside your dentist's office. Um, unfortunately, they can escape these cultivars and then grow in forests. So their leaves are arranged in these little clusters with red berries from late summer. And one impact uh, of Japanese barberry is they create this nice protected habitat underneath um, for mice and chipmunks, which sounds nice, but it can actually increase tick populations in areas where there's lots of barberry, and that in, in turn increases um, the risks of Lyme disease. It's also been linked to increases in invasive earthworm populations and soil erosion. And when the Japanese barberry um, in the fall kind of turns this like really nice red color. So there are some alternatives for that. Um, there's the winterberry holly, which has very similar shaped leaves that um, are kind of arranged in little clusters as well. And they have the red berries on there. And then there's also the American hazelnut, which is kind of this similarly shaped wide um, shrub rather than getting very tall. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a hard time with the remote control clicking back and forth between the slides. Um, but here we are, burning bush. Um, so burning bush is an ornamental woody shrub um, and it has this really vibrant red to purple fall, fall foliage. Um, this is a favorite in a lot of people's gardens um, because of that striking color. Um, but it can escape cultivation through its seed and by procreating when the branches touch the ground. Um, it's also resistant to deer browse, which may encourage um, increased browsing on native plants. And it has a very shallow root system, which increases the rates of um, erosion. 
Um, interestingly too about burning bush, this is a regulated species in New York State, um, which means that it's currently, um, you know, you're not allowed to plant a new burning bush into an ecosystem where it has potential to spread. But the wording here is really interesting. So another example of a regulated species on that list would be goldfish, which you can keep in its own like unique system in a goldfish bowl in your living room. And it's never going to escape unless you purposefully put it out into um, an ecosystem, into a pond. Um, but with burning bush, it being regulated this way suggests that the only legal way to grow it would be in a pot in your living room um, and not to plant it outside in your garden. Um, of course, if people already have burning bushes in their gardens, um, it just is referring to future plantings of burning bushes. But we get a, that really beautiful color from a lot of other native alternatives. So we've got the black chokeberry, the service berry, which has been mentioned before. This is kind of like a uh, uh, an all for one. And then the American cranberry bush and the high bush blueberry all give you that really beautiful, vibrant red color in the fall. So there are a couple of um, aquatic plants that. There are a couple of aquatic plants that can be found in water gardens, and that would be water lettuce and water hyacinths. And they both look a little different, but they have the same sort of um, threats and um, management practices. So um, the water lettuce leaves are light green and they're thick, softly hairy, and they have parallel veins and scalloped edges. Um, and they do produce a green berry that turns brown with maturity. Um, but they don't have very distinct um, flowers. Water hyacinth, on the other hand, is a free floating perennial. Um, it's an aquatic plant that has these really dark um, root systems that floats right underneath the plant. Um, these round, curved, glossy, bright green um, leaves that float above the surface. Um, it has the feathery roots, which will hang beneath the plant and showy purple flowers um, that grow on a spike, which rises approximately a foot above the leaves. Um, so both of these plants can reproduce rapidly and form dense mats on the surface of water, which can make swimming, boating, fishing, and other water recreational activities um, impossible. The mats will also block photosynthesis, which can reduce the oxygen level in the water and in turn decreases the number and diversity of aquatic species. Um, these can be controlled easily um, by hand pulling if it's a small infestation or larger infestations can be re mechanically removed um, using harvesters to scoop up plants. But if you have a water garden, we would suggest some native alternatives um, such as the spatter dock, yellow uh, pond lily uh, and the white water lily, water shield or the little floating heart are all great alternatives for your water garden. A little floating heart in particular has those really great shiny leaves similar to the water hyacinth. And the water lily flowers are stunning. So porcelain berry is an ornamental vine. It produces greenish yellow flowers that develop into hard berries in various shades of white, yellow, lilac, teal, or green. And they mature to a bright blue, blue, bright blue. Um, it quickly grows. It can outcompete with native vegetation, as you can see in that top picture. Um, it really grows over other plants. Um, it covers vegetation, suppressing and outcompeting native plants for um, sunlight. So, alternatively, there is the trumpet honeysuckle, um, which is the native honeysuckle that I was mentioning earlier. American bittersweet or fox grape is a really great alternative to the porcelain berry. It has the same color and shape seeds, um, but it is native and um, it's a vine, uh, which is similar to the porcelain berry. So if you wanted something to grow up a trellis, a fox grape is a great alternative. Okay, the Japanese tree lilac is a deciduous tree that grows to be um, 15 to 40 feet tall. It does have reddish brown bark and dark green leaves with a rounded base. Um, it has these small fragrant flowers that grow in large white clusters in the spring, usually in the beginning of June. Um, and they are ephemeral, which means they last for only a few weeks. 
Small saplings can be handfuls and larger trees are a little bit harder to manage, um, but pruning can reduce the flowering. Uh, the Japanese tree lilac is not um, commonly found in many places in New York, but it is a tree that people do use in their landscaping, so you might find it in regions, um, but I know it is popular in the capital region of New York. And so some native alternatives would be the summer sweet. Summer sweet is a shrub, so we won't get that tall tree-like um, if you're, if you're looking for a tree for your garden, but it does have those very fragrant, fragrant white flowers. And then there's the broadleaf meadow sweet, um, which has some very similar shaped flowers to the Japanese tree lilac. So now we just wanted to take an opportunity to pause um, for any questions. Um, you know, your native garden can be beautiful and um, diverse and colorful. Um, so if there's any questions at this point about any of the native alternatives, we'd be happy to take them. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yeah, this is John Garfunkel in Westchester County, New York. Um, I just saw something about the, the um, meadow sweet. Um, I believe there's a lot of, I believe the common name is Japanese meadow sweet. That's in a lot of gardens. Uh, if you could, I don't know if you, I just saw the, the native meadow sweet in the prior, prior, prior slide. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm, I'm guessing a lot of what we have is uh, the non-native that you see in yards. I have pink flowers. Um, it's, it's not terribly invasive. I mean, it's just, it stays in a, a nice little shrub, but, but I, I imagine something people want to replace over time. Right. Um, it's also called Spirea, S-P-I-R-E-A. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, um, so, I was getting this information off of the native um, uh, plant website. So if that information is not accurate. Um, oh, no, no, it's it's probably accurate. I'm just pointing out, I think I, I saw you, the previous slide just showed a, a um, I'm, I well believe it's a native metal. I'm just trying to get a right. sense. I, I can't, I'm having a really hard time um, going back and forth between these slides, unfortunately. Oh, okay. So um, there it is. Okay, yes. there you go. The broadleaf meadow suite. So I, was, I guess I was just, pointing out, I think, I mean, I know it exists at my house. There's some meadow sweet that it has the same flower shapes, but I believe it's a non-native. Um, so I'm glad to learn there is a native alternative. there. Yes. <laughs> um, We've got some questions in the chat too um, that we can tag team if you would like, Cecilia. So how common is porcelain berry in New York? Um, it's more co common in the southern part of the state, and there has been some confirmed uh, presence in St. Lawrence County, in Potsdam, and in um, Ogdensburg, New York. Mm -hmm. And I can't speak for Western. Cecilia, yeah. do you have porcelainberry? Um, so porcelain berry is one of our early detection species in Western New York, so we don't have very many populations of it. Um, I know it's something that we've been going out and um, doing rapid response uh, treatments on when it has popped up. And so there is a population that I know of that we're managing. Okay, and lilacs, to my understanding, are not native, but they're not invasive. So it's just one of those species that you either like them or you don't like them, but they're not considered to be invasive. Um, dandelions, I would just leave dandelions alone. Again, they're not invasive species. It's just your preference of what you prefer your yard to be like. I personally enjoy dandelions and I'd like to see any flower growing anywhere, really. Um, are there particular local nurseries or seed sources? Yeah, we'll include those types of resources in your follow-up email. So keep on the lookout for that. Is little floating heart the same as yellow floating heart? That's invasive. Um, little floating heart is different than yellow floating heart. 
Okay. Mm. All right, and everybody else is just saying that they do have a lot of porcelain berry in their area. And um, we will include control methods in your follow-up email as well, so you can learn more about how to control porcelain berry and other invasive species. Okay. So we're gonna just move right along here. Thanks for the questions. <clears throat> All right, so now I'm just gonna give a brief and general overview of control methods. Invasive plants can be controlled by manual, mechanical, and chemical methods. So the bulleted sections um, on this slide provide general tips for each method, but in general, manual controls such as digging and hand pulling is most effective on small invasive plant populations and is best done in the spring when the plants are smaller and the soil is loose. It is important to remove the root system and avoid leaving behind fragments that may re-sprout. Mechanical methods such as mowing and cutting are effective for medium-sized invasive plant populations where hand pulling would be very cumbersome and it is best to cut plants to ground level before flowering occurs and mowing will likely need to occur multiple times throughout the growing season. To avoid resprouting, it's important to remove clippings from the site and place them in a sunny spot for two weeks prior to disposal or composting. And if there are remains with seeds on them, place the remains in a black plastic bag uh, before placing them in the sun to be solarized. Uh, chemical methods are most effective on medium, large sized invasive plant populations where mechanical methods are unfeasible. It is important to follow all chemical label instructions to ensure the effectiveness and avoid causing harm to the environment and apply herbicides at peak growth before seed production. And fall is often the best time to apply herbicides to ensure the chemical is drawn to the plant's root system. And treated plants should be undisturbed for two weeks and no disposal is required for those. And again, this little chart here will be included in your follow-up email. And now we're gonna shift our discussion to just share some ways that you can get more involved. So a fun and easy way you can get involved is to take the Pledge to Protect, which is an outreach initiative that anyone can participate in. Uh, there are five pledge categories that can be taken. Lands and Trails, which is themed for landowners and hikers. Forests, which is themed for forest owners or managers. Waters, which is themed for boaters, waterfront property owners, and just water recre recreationalists. Community, which is themed for those who lived in urban areas. And gardens, which is themed for gardeners and landscapers. So upon taking the pledge, you become a protector and unlock resources themed for the category you have taken the pledge to protect. In addition to gaining access to helpful resources, protectors are also sent monthly emails that provide specific but simple actions you can take to protect your favorite hiking trails, paddleways, garden, or community from invasive species. And right after taking the pledge, you get instant bragging rights along with collectible virtual badges, chances to win prizes, and access to a social media toolbox, with pre-made graphics you can share on your social networks to celebrate becoming a protector. You can visit ipledgetoprotect.org to join the protectors today. And I'll place a URL link in the chat momentarily and also have a link in your follow-up email. Another great way to get involved is to volunteer. Salilo Prism has an invasive species volunteer surveillance network where you can be trained to recognize and report invasive species threatening the Slilo region. We also have opportunities to assist our eDNA project and join removal efforts on the water and on land. Uh, and again, links for learning how to volunteer will be in your follow-up email. And Cecilia's got some volunteer opportunities to share as well. Okay, so there are some opportunities to volunteer in the Western New York region. Um, we have an IMAP invasives training that you can attend to learn how to identify and report invasive species, and then go out on your own time and report, um, especially our data gap species that we're looking for to fill in some information about uh, the range and distribution of um, our, these species. 
Um, we also are doing a data gap species photo contest. So you could submit a photograph if you're um, a little bit more on the creative side. Um, we definitely are using this as a way to build our, um, our photo library for different species. And then also we have a Rails Trails Community Science pro Program to help report and manage invasive species on the Rails to Trails pathway in North Tonawanda. And um, in this program, we're training volunteers to recognize invasive species that are on the trail, going out on their own time to survey them, and uh, then we'll have some volunteer days for management. And Western New York also has a Pledge to Protect program. Um, Ours, we have banners that circulate through um, all events that we're a part of. So stop by the next event and sign our banner and you'll get a pledge card and a sticker. Um, these events, these uh, banners will be at any events that we do ourselves or any events that we're tabling at. Um, and uh, we're really excited to continue collecting signatures on the Pledge to Protect. And there are many resources available to learn what plants are native and climate smart to your region, uh, all of which I'm going to briefly mention during this webinar and will provide links in your follow up email. So the National Wildlife Federation has developed a tool to help you identify plants that are native to your zip code. Uh, the New York State DC has developed brochures and plant lists that showcase plants that are native to the Northeast and what plants to avoid with their native alternatives. Many of this information we went over today. And the North, Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change or Risk Management Group has developed a brochure that outlines gardening for present and future conditions using native species adapted to both current and future hardiness zones and a list of climate smart plants native to the Northeast. So this is uh, just some more information, um, some resources available. Um, all of this is found on the um, Western New York PRISM online resources pay, uh, tab. And then we also have, um, I noticed in the, in the chat that someone had asked about local nurseries. Um, so if you go to that first link there, westernyorkprism.org slash get involved slash be plant wise, um, we have some plant nurseries that are in the Western New York region um, that we recommend for um, buying some buying your native plants. Okay, and as promised, the link to take the online NYSOF survey can be found um, at the link that you see on this flyer, and you can also scan with your phone, and I will put the link in the chat in just a moment. Uh, so take the survey for a chance to win a boot brush, a cool 3D spotted lanternfly wooden puzzle, uh, temporary tattoos, and lots of other cool prizes. And um, we will go ahead and share that link for you in just a moment here. But I'll give you a moment just to write it down or to scan as well. Okay. All right. And now uh, that completes our presentation today. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them now. I did see in the chat that someone had asked about a chameleon plant. Um, I am not familiar with that. Are you, Cecilia? And um, if not, we can always find some information and, and email it out to, to everybody as well. Um, I'm not familiar with the chameleon plant. Okay, I'm going to take a moment just to grab some URLs and place them in the chat before we leave. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to come off of mute. Okay, here okay. is the survey link. I had um, to stop so sharing the screen to give it to you. Sean, what's your um, question on prison priorities? Sure, yes, thank you. Um, so I've, um, I did a lot of uh, volunteer projects in the past before I have my, my own home and now I have my own home in Woodlands and I have a lot to still work through here. And I've looked at the prison resources here. I'm in the lower Hudson uh, district 
And I've, I've always been curious looking at the prison prioritization. It's it's sad because certain of the ones you you review and the, the most popular ones, the prison prioritization says, well, it's lowest prioritization because these are quite widespread. So it's a little dis disenchanting uh, right. um, reading that. And I'm trying to, I've sent, I've sent a note to prison folks in the past. I'm just trying to get a sense. Is there a better, um, you know, better way to think about it when controlling your own invasives when you want to pick priorities? Because I've been here now two years in my home and I'm maybe a third of the way there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've just been like making up prioritization along the way. Uh, trying yeah, to... Um, so to, I kind of hear two different questions in yeah. your questions so i'm gonna uh i'm gonna tell you a little bit about the tier system and then i'll uh, then i'll address your um your own property and 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 how to kind of come up with a management plan in your own property um so the tier system um yeah it's interesting because you're completely right john the ones that the the species that we all know about are the ones that are tier four species um and that means that they are so widespread that um trying to eradicate them in a, in a state on a statewide level is pretty much impossible. Yeah. Um, so just to give a quick background of, of our of our tier rankings, and this is a statewide tier ranking. So tier one is um, a species that um, we is approaching the region. It's not yet in the area. Um, for Western York Prism, an example of that would be the spotted lanternfly. Um, it's in other prisms, but it's not yet in our region. So our management is we're spreading um, awareness. To make sure that when uh, people are, when it does reach our region, that people see it and that we can report it and address it uh, before it gets too widespread. Um, we also have the tier two species, which is um, early detection. Uh, so that would be like porcelain berry for us here in Western New York, where um, when we see or when we, when a uh, population is reported, we have a plan to go out and address that before that species can get too far um, established in our area. And then there is the tier three, which is eradicate, I'm sorry, which is containment. And so in a tier three species, you're just trying to keep that species from spreading outside of where it's already established a population. And then you get to tier four, which is your typical knotweed and your phragmites and right. um, things like that, that, that are really, they're not any less harmful to the environment um, than the tier one or the tier two species. They're just as harmful to um, environment and uh, the economy and human health. But unfortunately, because they are so widespread at this point, um, we call that asset protection. So um, the management for a tier four species would be if you've got um, a, an area of land that you need to protect from the invasives coming in, then you would do management just on that land against not weed or phragmites or something like that. So in your case, John, um, your your property would be the the asset that you're trying to protect, and then right. you would need to come up with a management plan of like where you what species to start with and go from there. Um, and you said you're from uh, the capital region. No, Westchester County, Lower Hudson. Westchester County, Lower Hudson. Okay, and I'm not sure what um I would look into this for your prism. Um, I'm not sure what resources they have specifically, but in Western New York, we have a crew, um, we have a program where people can, we help people with the homeowners with their with management plans that so we can mm. help give you some resources and help suggest, um, you know, where to start first, sort of. So um, I would look into your local prism to see if they have something like that that they can help you with. Um, I'd also like to add, I put in the chat a link to the statewide um, tiered species list story map that explains how it came to be. And then also the statewide invasive species tiered ranking list that is like how New York State ranks the species. And then it's also broken down um, by, pr by the prism as well. And there's also an invasive plant management decision analysis tool, which um, I'm in the process of trying to grab the link for that as well. And as soon as I get a hold of it, I'll throw it in the chat, but I'll definitely put all this information in a follow up email for everybody as well. Yeah. Yes, thank you. We're always trying to reach more people here and uh, make this more visible. Oh, here it is. All right. 
throwing it in the chat for you now. Good questions. Are there any other questions? I'm looking through the chat and I'm not seeing anything else. I think we may be complete. Um, again, do visit um, nyis.info backslash nyisaw to learn of other events happening throughout the week um, and check the chat because we've been throwing some links to resources in there and Cecilia just put a native plant suppliers link in there. And just keep an eye on your inbox that you registered with your email. Uh, and we'll be sending out probably tomorrow um, a follow-up email with all sorts of resource links for you. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us. Have a great day and happy NISA. Thank you everyone.